access. So listen, New Year's is my favorite holiday. It's my favorite holiday. It really is. It's my favorite. New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. It's so, I love it so much. And I was convinced that everyone else loved it too because like if I do, it must be everyone does, right? But no, I did some Googling and I was shocked at what I found. Thanksgiving, Veterans Day, Mother's Day, Memorial Day, Christmas. New Year's was like ninth down on the list. And I was like, how is that possible, right? What is not to love? It's a clean slate. There's, you know, new calendars and planners, and I get to spend way too much at Staples getting things that I think are going to organize my life. And every year I like, I try to get my husband to do what I call a yearly review, which is like we look back at all the things we totally failed at the year before. And if he can't think of anything, I like to give him some that like just to jog his memory. And he doesn't like it, but I love it. And but seriously, like what is not to love, right? What is not to love about a holiday like this? It is a natural rhythm, a time on the calendar when pretty much the whole world stops and considers, reflects on what has happened and looks forward to the future, right? And as Christians, it's an opportunity for us to stop and to reflect on what God has done this last year and what he might be wanting to do in the future. It's like a Kairos moment built right into the calendar for us, right? And remember, Kairos, Pastor Joe's been talking a lot about Kairos, and um, it's a Greek word, and it kind of just means like opportunity, okay? So we t- we, it sounds like really fancy, but it just means opportunity. And when we talk about it in relation to the Bible, we're talking about like an opportune moment, right? Or the right time. So a Kairos moment is an opportunity for us to pause and to consider God's hand in our life, to consider, to recognize the holy intersecting the mundane, right? The holy intersecting the everyday. And it's a chance to recognize God's hand in our lives and to hopefully let him change us. So now listen, you're going to listen to this message, and inevitably, at some point, you're going to think to yourself, this sounds like it would be a really good Christmas Eve message. And you'd be right. So we're all going to say, on three, we're going to say, Christmas is over. Ready? One, two, three. Christmas is over. Thanks. I know. But I still think this is going to be a good message for us, okay? I know that Christmas is over, but listen, the Bible wasn't written with dates on it. And it wasn't written to say, oh, this part is for this time of year and you don't read it the rest of the year, right? So we're going to go on and we are going to look back at what we've been learning this last month of December. And we're going to look at each of the messages that we've heard about Zechariah and about Joseph and about the shepherds. And we're going to close out our Kairos Christmas series. And then we're going to go into the new year together. Amen? So let me pray. Jesus. Slow my tongue down. I can feel that I'm going fast. I just pray for your presence in this place. I pray that we would leave here different than we walked in. And I pray that your spirit would fall on us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to start with Zechariah. Now, we heard about Zechariah from um, Pastor John Mole, and in uh, his story is in uh, Luke chapter 1. And I just want to get to my first spot here. Now, remember, in the Old Testament, God often sent, um, like, prophets, right? Men that were uh, chosen by God and had a message and spoke to the people, like, on his behalf, right? And so we get up to the last prophet in this book. It's called Malachi in the Old Testament. And um, he's, he's giving his message, and he's talking about this day of the Lord. And he ends the whole book like this. He says, see, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. And then it ends. The book is closed. And we don't hear another word from one of God's prophets for 400 years. It's called the silent period. And so now when we pick back up today, we're going to look in the book of Luke with Zechariah, and he is this priest, right? Pastor John told us all about this. He's a priest. He is married to this woman, Elizabeth. They're um, advanced in age. They don't have any children, right? And um, 
when we meet up with him, it's like his time to go and to uh, do his service in the temple, right? So we're going to open up to chapter 1 of Luke, verse 9. Like I said, it's up on the screen if you want it. I need like a second. I need this stool. This is going to make my life much easier. Here we go. My Bible's too big. Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 9. It says, He was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zacharias saw him, he was startled. He was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zachariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. And then it goes on to talk about how John is is this fulfillment. This baby is going to fulfill prophecy, right? This baby is the next prophet of God. After 400 years, this baby is going to come, and he is going to prepare the way for the Messiah. But in verse 18, thanks, Joe. Happy New Year, buddy. Thanks. Thanks so much. Oh, that, yeah, higher. Oh, yeah, perfect. That's amazing. Thank you so much, sir. So in verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe in my words which will come true at their proper time. And so Zechariah goes out from the temple, and he's completely mute, right? He can't speak at all for months. See, Zechariah is, he's serving in the temple, and he's going about his everyday life and, and doing his duty and doing what he's supposed to do. And suddenly, an angel shows up and tells him about this miracle that is gonna change the rest of his life. Talk about a Kairos moment right? Like if an angel shows up right now, rips the ceiling off the thing, and starts giving us messages, I think that's that's an opportunity to stop and consider, right? Maybe God wants to do something. That's a Kairos moment. That's the holy intersecting the everyday. And Zechariah has this opportunity, right? He can press in and engage what God wants to do or not. And listen, he definitely has this moment of disbelief, right? He says, how can this be, right? And the angel is like, oh, are you serious? You're going to question this right now? I'm an angel. And he gets struck mute. But we can assume that God does a mighty work in Zechariah over the course of these months. Because ultimately, he does obey. Because surprise, Elizabeth does get pregnant miraculously. And so when the baby is born, Zechariah goes and, and he writes on this tablet and says, the baby's name is John. And then, just like the angel told him to do, and then it says in verse 64, immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed and he began to speak, praising God. He struggled, but ultimately he obeyed. And we see the birth of John the Baptist, the voice in the desert that would prepare the way for the Lord. Zechariah was faced with a Kairos moment, and he's forever changed by it. His son, this baby that they had prayed for, would go on to be the prophet that calls and preaches the coming kingdom. And Zechariah would never be the same. But he's not the only one that had a Kairos Christmas that year, right? We learned about Joseph. In fact, we talked about Joseph the last time that we were together when Pastor Joe was preaching. And we heard about he, how he is this man after God's heart, right? That he's a man that has his own plan, but then he runs into God's plan. We're going to look at Matthew 1, verse 18. It says, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, and before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. 
So they're engaged. They're almost married, right? And, and Joseph finds out that Mary's pregnant. Now, I don't know about you, but this is not really the kind of news that you want to hear, right, from your fiance. And the fact that she says, like, it's by the Holy Spirit doesn't make it any better. It doesn't make it any easier. He's not like, oh, okay, that sounds great, right? It, this is a hard situation. And so Joseph is trying to figure out what to do, right? And he's like, man, this is so bad. Like, I can't stay in this. You know, she's probably cheating on me. That I'm just, his mind is probably going to the worst. He's like, what am I going to do? But you know what? He's still a good guy, right? And he's like, man, this is, this is hard for me, but this is hard for Mary. How do I make this? How do I just make this go away quietly? So he decides, I'm going to just divorce her quietly. I'm not going to make a big deal out of this, right? But that's, that's my plan, you know? But then, verse 20, after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Another angel. Take note. So Joseph gets this terrible news, right? He comes up with his own plan, and then an angel comes to him and says, no, 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 this is the plan. This is what God wants you to do. And again, I think this should qualify as a Kairos moment. An angel shows up. God might want to do something, right? They should stop. It's an angel coming in a dream. It's the holy intersecting the everyday. It is Kairos. But Joseph didn't ask for this. He wasn't preparing for this, right? He's a young man that has been dreaming of his future and his wife and his family. And he gets this unbelievable news that could shatter his dreams that he's probably been dreaming of since he was a little boy. He's in the middle of a Kairos moment. He's in the middle of this opportunity and he can 100% say no, right? We don't think about that, but he can say no. He can just walk away. He can stop this whole thing right now and go on living his own life according to his own plan. And he'll get a wife and he'll get a kid and he'll get the white picket fence. But what he'll miss out on is unimaginable. And so what does he do? Verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. And he took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. See, Joseph was faced with an opportunity. And he said yes. He laid down his own dreams and his own plans, and he said yes to God's plan, and he would never be the same. But Joseph wasn't the last one to have a Kairos Christmas, right? We also heard about the shepherds. You know, Pastor Joe kicked off our whole series with the shepherds and um, telling us about them all the way back in the beginning of December. And, you know, as he mentioned, we like to think, at least I do, like to think of shepherds kind of like today's cowboys, right? And so I'm like, Oh, they're good, wholesome people, like real salt of the earth people. And, you know, they ride around and they do campfires and they sing country western songs, right? But that's not how this was. That's not what the shepherds were like in the Bible, right? In this culture, they were uneducated, unkempt, unwelcome. They were the lowly of society. They were looked down on by everyone. And so one night they're out in the fields, they're going about their business. And then let's read together what happens. Luke 2, verse 8 says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, watching over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. More angels. They're in another Kairos moment, right? These men, these lowlifes of society are tending their sheep going about their normal lives, when suddenly an angel calls to them and invites them to attend the birth of the Savior of the world. A Kairos moment. Heaven 
touching earth, wholly intersecting the everyday. And listen, the Jewish people at this time were waiting for years and years and years for the Messiah. This mighty king that was going to come and deliver them. This is a big deal for everyone. Everyone is waiting for this news that the Messiah is coming. And now is the moment. So does God send angels to announce to everyone? To like blow trumpets all over the sky? Right? That's what I would have done. Surely he could have. There's enough angels popping up around, right? Wouldn't that have been a better way to ring in the news of the Messiah? But that's not what he does. No, God chooses the lowly and the humble. These shepherds that are despised by all, and he gives them this amazing opportunity. But with the moment comes another choice. They can say, I'm just a shepherd. I don't, I don't know about this, man. Nobody wants to hear from me. Nobody likes me. Nobody, they know what I'm, what I'm like. They know what I'm about. Like, they don't want to hear this, right? And they could go on with their lives. Or they could go to Bethlehem. Let's read verse 15. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby was lo- who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up these things in her, uh, and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. They went to Bethlehem, and they were changed forever. And these lowly shepherds have their very first Kairos Christmas. So Zechariah, Joseph, the shepherds, all different people from different backgrounds with different, and different places, but all with one thing in common. Angels, apparently, right? What is with all the angels? Just kidding. They all experience this Kairos moment. This moment in their lives where the holy was intersecting the mundane. This holy moment coming into whatever they were doing in their everyday lives. And they are faced with a choice to either press into what God wants to do or not. And they all surrender and they all would be forever changed. And listen, their Kairos moment would stretch on for generations as Christ, the long-awaited Messiah, steps down off his throne and comes and is born of human flesh in the very image of God as a little baby in a little town called Bethlehem, the holy intersecting the mundane, and the world is forever changed. But what does that have to do with us now, today? Christmas is over! The new year is coming, and it's time to get back to real life, right? Me and Laura were just saying, gosh, we are moving past the holiday phase, and we are ready for some routine, and let's get back in, and let's get back to real life, right? Changing diapers, paying bills, going to work, cooking dinner. And every week, we got Pastor Joe saying, Kairos moment, Kairos moment, what's your Kairos moment? And sometimes, if I'm honest, I can wish I got the angels. You know, you ever feel like that? Like, wouldn't that be easy? I'd be able to spot a Kairos moment too if angels were showing up every other second, right? And man, I, if I had an angel that came and told me what to do, I'd be a better wife, I'd be a better mom, a better friend, a better whatever, 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 right? These guys had it so easy. But here's the thing. We really don't need the angels to tell us anything. We have something so much better. Because what did Luke 2 say? A Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ, the Lord. Jesus Christ was born, and that doesn't change on December 26th, or on January 1st, or on April 12th. Emmanuel, God with us. Not God was with us, not God will be with us, but God with us. No longer is the kingdom coming. The kingdom is here forever and ever. Amen? The holy intersected the mundane in the most unimaginable and magnificent way ever imagined. As Christ, the very image of the invisible God, stepped down and lived among us. That 
is a Kairos moment. And it's one that lives on in every moment. Because here's the thing. A Kairos moment was not intended to be a one-off in the Christian life. It's not just a moment where the heavens open and the angels sing. And it's not just one day in December. It is every moment of every single day. How do I know? Because Jesus is alive. He didn't stay a baby in a manger. He lived, he died, he rose again for your sin and for mine because of his great love for us. He is alive and he gave us his word and his spirit. And that is the Kairos. That is the opportunity. Forget the angel. Listen, angels are great. They have a role to play. But we can have the very spirit of God alive in us. And so we are given this kairos, this opportunity to live out the gospel, not once, not twice, but with every step and with every breath, every single day. And for those that don't know him, listen, for those that don't know him, now is the time. Now is the time. You want 2023 to be different? You want new year, new me? Don't leave here without talking to someone about what Jesus did for you. And for those that do know him, now is still the moment. Now is the time to surrender, the time to trust him in a deeper way than ever before. This is a Kairos moment, and I beg you not to let it pass you by. But I also beg you not to let it be the only one. I was reading from this author, and she says that like, when, when we get this idea, when we understand this, that we realize that nothing is neutral. Nothing. You can't just waste an hour on the internet. No room is just space. No hour is meaningless. No meal is mere sustenance. Every rhythm and every atom of existence are spaces in which the kingdom can come. In which the story of God's love can be told again. See, when we walk out of here and we go on with our lives, that's a Kairos moment. And tomorrow when you're off of work because we had another day and so you're going to run errands, that's a Kairos moment. And when you go back to work on Tuesday morning, that's a Kairos moment. And when you tuck your kids in at night and when you cry because you're lonely and when you're paying your mortgage and when you're taking out the trash, it's all a Kairos moment. He is alive. It is all an opportunity. It is all the Kairos, right? Because Jesus is alive. You don't have to wait for a Kairos moment. You don't have to wait for a conflict or a crisis or a fight or whatever it is. You don't have to wait even for a day on a calendar. Every breath is an opportunity. An opportunity to let God in or keep it at bay. An opportunity to recognize that he is at work in every detail, in every situation of our lives. And that he invites us to be part of it because of his great love for us. And that will change everything about us. That is my prayer for 2023, and it is my prayer for you. Amen.